welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. I said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro. Glad you're back with me again this week. And uh, today we're going to talk about, well... We're going to talk about something that if you're limited on gardening space or you're maybe you're challenged by a, a difficult growing climate, then this episode just may be for you. On today's podcast episode, I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of gardening in containers and how to get started and, and maintain your very own container garden. So uh, stay tuned for that. Let's jump right in with some homestead updates. What have we been doing the last couple of weeks? Uh, uh, did some quail processing, I actually processed all of my quail and and the reason i did that is uh for the winter i mean i i've been getting tons of eggs from them but i just decided i've got a pretty good connection uh, around here where i can actually get new quail really cheap and um you know i thought i'd just take the winter off of raising quail and some one less animal i have to water and feed and you know keep the water uh uh from being frozen and all that and i thought you know i'm gonna i'm gonna stop raising quail for the winter time go ahead and butcher the ones i've got put them in the freezer and i, I gotta tell you I, I i cooked some up the other day and uh yeah i'm gonna enjoy nibbling on those over the winter um but yeah we processed the quail around here uh just had see two days ago three days ago uh what's going to be the last batch of rabbits born on the homestead this year. Cause I, again, I don't, uh, you know, I don't breed them year round. I, I usually only get a, a couple litters a year out of, of each one of my does. I don't like to be too big of a burden on them. So, uh, this one that just gave birth a couple days ago, that'll be the last batch I'll get this year. And we'll raise those up and get those in the freezer before winter. And, um, we'll have a, a good little stock of, uh, rabbit meat for the winter going into the winter time. Uh, see, I planted some, uh, fall crops the other day or a couple weeks ago and those are all starting to pop up and grow. I got some lettuce, some spinach, uh, I don't know, a few other greens, uh, going. Of course we have the kale st- has stayed going all summer and it'll go into the winter. Uh, I just kind of, uh, pick at that when I, I want some that that'll stay going. Uh, what else did I plant? Planted some, uh, beets. Um, uh, I don't know. I planted a bunch of stuff. I can't even think of it all right now, but it's all starting to pop up and come up and we're going to have a nice little fall crop. It looks like. So yeah, I mean, things are going pretty good around here. Uh, got a few things going on. It's, you know, I haven't been working real hard around here, to be honest with you. I haven't been taking on any new building projects here the last few weeks. I haven't, uh, just been kind of maintaining, you know, and, uh, uh, keeping things going now now the uh, tomatoes in the greenhouse are just crazy Uh, as i've said before i it gets too hot in there you know really do anything through the summertime so what i did was i put some on each side of the greenhouse i built my shelves so they have the removable um slats uh where you set things on and so basically it's just a a boxed in frame well what i did was i built uh raised beds in the bottoms of both sides of the uh the greenhouse i took out all the shelves so i just have the frame of the shelf uh, the two by four frame that i built in there for the shelving and it made a fantastic uh uh tomato uh basket or whatever you want to call it, just to kind of keep maintain trellis to maintain the tomatoes inside of that now i've had to cut off i cut off anything that's running outside of that so i can walk down through the middle because otherwise the entire greenhouse would just fill up with tomato plants but they've grown clear up into the ceiling and uh, i've been picking a lot of tomatoes out of there and that's good because i had some blight issues with a lot of my tomatoes outside of the greenhouse but the ones in the greenhouse were not touched they're doing great we've been able to maintain a fantastic uh, tomato crop in the greenhouse so i've been real pleased with that and i'll be yanking those out you know, uh, you know, a couple months and, um, uh, putting everything back together and start getting ready for growing some cool weather crops in the greenhouse into the winter, uh, some greens and things like that. And then, you know, just maintain that through the winter and then come spring, early, early spring, we'll start our uh, seed starting again and getting some, uh, getting some seedlings going in there. So I'm really liking the, uh, 
how the the greenhouse is incorporating into the homestead. You know, it's just uh, it's becoming a year round tool. I mean, even though it's hot in there in the summer, things like tomatoes and peppers are going to love it. You know, it's, it gives me that uh, early start uh, in the garden, and even in the winter, I'm able to uh, utilize it for some some food. So. Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying that. So yeah, I have some you know a lot of things going on around here, but nothing overwhelming or or big. Uh, hope everything's going well on your homestead. So let's go ahead and jump into some homestead relevant news. Now I had a completely different plan on this today, and I'm even a little bit leery about sharing what I'm going to share in the homestead relevant news. You've probably heard, maybe in these circles that we run in, maybe you've heard about Grant Schultz and Versaland and what he's facing there. And um, I I had had it, seen it posted in our uh, Homestead Front Porch Facebook group uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, and I intended to share it on the next podcast. And, and anyway, the the deal is Grant Schultz has a, a farm that he calls Versaland in Johnson County, Iowa, and he he put a plea video out uh, telling about what's going on he's he's uh, being denied some zoning by the um by the local government there for his farm and he put a little video out on facebook it's went semi viral in in our circles of course uh, it has and you know i i i've heard from grant schultz in Versaland on other podcasts like the survival podcast and some other podcasts I listen to. And, you know, I've heard a little bit about what he's doing out there and it always sounded like a really good thing. So I was like, great, you know, I want to share this. I want to share about what's going on. I haven't heard Jack Spearco share about this on his podcast a few days ago. And anyway, the, you know, I'm a little bit late coming to this, um, because the actual meeting was September 14th and here it is September 18th when I'm recording this. So he already had the meeting and I was curious. I thought, well, what happened? And the only reason I was going to share it still was because he still has a legal fund that he's raising money for that you can support him and all that. So I thought, well, I'll go, you know, look and see what happened at the meeting. And it turns out that, um, I found out that, uh, what he was trying to accomplish at the board meeting, they, they unanimously voted uh, to reject his rezoning re- request. And, you know, so I thought, well, what's going on here? And I ran across an article and the headline is Grant Schultz facts to consider. And, and, um, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's the other side of the story. And, and I don't know Grant Schultz and I only know what he shares in the video and what I've heard about Versaland in the past and you know he he's it seems like he's doing a lot of great things there and i'm not i'm not even going to say all this just so i can tear down the man cuz i don't know him personally and i don't know the situation fully all i'm saying is he's trying to raise money for for his legal fund and there's another side of the story so what i wanted to do was in our show notes today i wanted to share a link to grant schultz article at Versaland, his Versaland.com slash support. And you can go there and you can watch this video that he put out talking about what's happening from his point of view and, and everything that's going on. And, but I also wanted to put a link from the other side, um, from, uh, it's called uh, Draco Hill and their website says Draco Hill reclaiming the earth one worm at a time. Okay. And these, these, um, according to, to this article, they're the folks that actually own Grant Schultz land and they, uh, Grant Schultz makes a payment to them to use the land. Um, he was buying it, I guess, maybe on some kind of contract. I don't know. I don't know all the details, but read the article. Um, it sounds like these folks are very ecologically minded as well. They have plans for the land. If Grant Schultz can't buy it and can't get his rezoning and all this, um, they lay out some some statements and some documents in their article of why this is going on and and I'll tell you it's it doesn't it doesn't uh reflect <laughs> in a good way on Grant Schultz. So I'm not saying that I'm not leaning to one side or the other other than to say if you're going to if your plan was to give to his legal fund, you might want to read both sides of the story because you need to make up your own mind on that still. If you know Grant, you know this is all up and up and you 
and you say, hey, I'm giving to the man. I think I love what he's doing. I love what he stands for. By all means, I'm not saying anything different. I'm just saying if you don't know him and you don't know the situation fully, you might want to read both sides before you decide to give your hard-earned money to something that you may not believe in. So I'll put links to both of those articles in the show notes um, because, you know, I'm, I'm – listen, I am – I, I'm not somebody that's going to stand on a soapbox for government and local governments because I've had my battles with them. Um, you know, there in so many towns and so many places, you can't raise chickens, you can't raise rabbits, you can't grow a garden in your front yard. I mean, all these things that are just ridiculous to me. So when I see something like this, I go, "Wow, I want to, I want to tell you guys about it. And I want you to fight for this guy." But at the same time. I want to be fair and I want to be honest. And if there's a real problem, you know, like, for example, I remember one time reading an article about how these people, all the cities coming against them so they can't grow their own food. Well, there was so much more to this story. I mean, they were really, the, the things they were doing were really reflecting on and affecting their neighbors. Okay. And, and there was just a lot going on there that, that was more than just not being able to grow your food. Uh, it turned out the city had no problem with them putting, you know, gardens in their yard. It was more about the trash and the, the way they were doing it and some of the things they were trying to do and letting animals run wild into their neighbor's yard. And I mean, there was so much more to the story. And I, I chose at that time not to go out and, and, and mention that on the podcast. So I always try to, I don't always try, but I sometimes try to make sure there's not more to the story. And I, I kind of ran across this accidentally. So. But there is more to the story, evidently, or another side to the story, evidently. And I hadn't heard that. And it, you know, I don't think they're as popular as Grant Schultz. So they're not getting shared and they're not being heard like Grant Schultz is. And, you know, I, I just want to be fair about it. You still make up your mind. I'm not saying don't give to the man. I'm not saying don't support him. I'm just saying, you know, balance it out. Look at both sides, make up your mind and decide, is this what I want to do? Do I want to support this or do I want to share this other side of the story? So both articles are there. I'm not even going to read them. I'm not going to go into, I was going to play Grant Schultz video when I first started this. Cause I was, Oh, I want to help him out. I'm not going to play his video, the audio to his video. I'm not going to read the other article. I'm going to display them both in the show notes of this podcast episode. So if you want to find them, you go to smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 65. This is episode number 65. And you'll see the links to uh, uh, Grant Schultz's uh, article at Versaland. You'll see the uh, link to this other article right below it. So check them out. Make up your own mind. I'm not going to say one thing or another. I just want to say check out both sides. Be fair. Uh, okay, let's go on with that. I, you know, that's news <laughs> and, that, and that's relevant to, to us. But uh, check it out and. Uh, and, uh, you know, make, make, make an informed decision. That's what I'm here to help you do today. Uh, beyond that, let's talk about the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. Uh, I've been, you know, asking questions in there for the podcast. And the last question I asked was actually a couple weeks ago. And the question for this week's podcast episode is, what is the number one reason you started or want to start homesteading and this was a this thread kind of blew up a little bit it it, it uh, you know a lot of people had a lot to say and uh i won't get into the all of the uh, uh everybody's response but there will be a link to that facebook thread if you're a part of the homestead front porch you can click on that and go in and read the thread if you're not part of the homestead front porch facebook group it is a closed group but all you have to do to join is ask so click on that thread it'll take you to the page and you can join up and uh, you do ask a couple questions in there just to make sure you're not a robot or a or some um, somebody trying to infiltrate and be a troll in our uh, our group but answer those two questions yes and we'll get you right in there and then you can check out this thread with uh, all these answers of what people think their number one reason is that they started homesteading or want to start homesteading. And I'll just read a few of them here. Uh, let's see the uh, Jason here says the closest it's the closest thing to printing my own money that the government would allow. The more I produce for myself, the less I have to spend in taxes. Very good. Um, here we have uh, Lana. She says, "Doctor told me I I might." need to consider disability. I decided that 40 was too young for that. So she started homesteading, you know, you growing your own food and getting good exercise. Right. Um, 
<laughs> okay, we have a, a funny here for about a zombie apocalypse. Okay, yeah, I mean, you know, hey, teach their own. Uh, free to enjoy life. Um, someone says it's the first garden I'd ever planted that was at my mom's house. And the fruit, oh, it says the first garden I'd ever planted was at my mom's house and the fruit rotted on the vine because we had so much. It struck me that plants want to grow. Harvesting seeds is easy and food should be free. Good local organic food should be free for everyone. Um, that realization mixed with a few health issues and life challenges made me want to be more self-sufficient. Uh, very good. I, I, I like all that. Um, here we have one that says, to continue the self-reliant uh, lifestyle our grandparents instilled in us. Very good. Another person says, uh, see, I always felt I was born a century too late, but I also do this for health and, and thrift. Uh, we also wanted hands-on skills and science for the homeschool kids. Very good. A lot of really good answers in here. I'm just going to kind of skip uh, through a few. Self-sustainability, <laughs> you know, escape the concrete jungle, um, independence. Uh, let's see here. I got tired of paying large amounts for groceries and not knowing what I was eating. Amen. Yeah. Um, I like what this person says. Something is coming. Not sure what. <laughs> Disease, pandemic, government collapse, war, global warming. A storm of some kind. Maybe not now. Maybe 50 years from now. We wanted to be prepared. Not preppers, but in a positive and upbeat way. We want to be as self-sufficient as possible and provide a place for our kids and our grandkids to be able to run to if needed. I, I think that's good. And, and, and again, I... I not because I necessarily think that something is coming real soon. And like this person says, maybe 50 years from now. And who knows? I mean, that's the thing, you know, I, I like about homesteading is that even if nothing ever does come, it's still a better way to live. But if something does come, it's definitely a better way to live. I mean, it's, it's preparedness and it's not that doomsday prepper mindset necessarily. It's just a better way to live. And it's, and it ensures uh, food. Um, it ensures a lifestyle that can be maintained. Um, you know, what's that old Alabama song? It talks about, um, uh, song of the South or, uh, you know, it, it starts to say there's a, there's a, uh, a, a line in there that says, you know, somebody told us wall street fell, but we were so poor that we couldn't tell. And I, I don't necessarily mean the homesteaders are, are poor, but I'm just saying that was their lifestyle is why they couldn't tell because they were growing their own food and they were the way they were living. Wall Street falling didn't really affect them that much. Their life kind of stayed the same. It wasn't necessarily that they were, I'm sure they were poor, but their lifestyle ensured that the things that affected, you know, modern society at that time didn't necessarily uh, reflect on them because their life went on the same. That's, those things didn't affect them. Uh, they, they were still growing their own food. Uh, they were still you know, paying whatever bills they had in the same way, you know, they were still doing everything they, they did before. It didn't affect them because they didn't have any money in the stock market for one thing. But I'm just saying my point to that is that even when those things happen, your life can go on the same. So I think that's a good, I think that's a good, uh, response. Uh, um, I want my children to be healthier, happier and less stressful life. It can definitely certainly do that. Uh, I want to be closer to the earth, my food and the rhythms of life. Uh, I'm just going to skip through a few here. Awesome way to raise kids. Um, and this one, this person says, I watched Food Inc. and literally didn't feel right buying anything from the grocery store ever again. And, you know, if you have never watched that, it's worth watching. It makes you think. It definitely makes you think about what you're eating and, 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 and the food system. And it will, it, I do believe it makes an impact on you and makes you want to grow your own food as well. Uh, this person says, I grew up on processed food. We never ate healthy. And as an adult, I didn't know how to process and cook fresh green beans. I had only had veggies out of a can. I wanted my children to know where their food came from and the work that's put into it. Very, very good. Skipping through a few more here. I'm just kind of scrolling down. I, again, go read some of these. There's some really good ones in here I'm skipping over. I'm just kind of browsing because I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. Uh, I want to live more simply. I want to be able to live a fulfilling life with less money. Very good. This person says, I am wanting to get started, mainly to become more self-reliant, make better use of what I already have, uh, to make less shopping trips, to be more economical, efficient, and to eat healthier. See, here we have people who are getting into homesteading or just starting or, or going to start homesteading for that. But I would I would tell this person, start where you're at. There's so many things you can do. I don't even know where you're at. You might be in an apartment somewhere in a big city, but you can do some things right now. 
Guarantee you. There's so many things you can do. This person says, I just like being self-sufficient. I don't like to depend on anyone but myself. You know, there there is a level of, of what I'm going to call self-sufficiency in being a homestead, homesteader. But the reality is we all need people. Even if you're using people for your bar- barter, you're not going to grow or do everything you need to do on your homestead. You're going to have to need other people. And that's not to say you're not self-sufficient because bartering is a trade. It's a skill, right? It's a self-sufficiency skill, being able to barter. But it's not just relying on yourself necessarily because you are, you know, bartering and trading or buying from other people locally even. So, I mean, I under, I, I'm, I understand the self-sufficiency mindset and depending on yourself, absolutely. But I just wanted to take that a little further and say self-sufficiency doesn't mean not depending on others for help uh, or trade or barter. I just enjoy doing things myself. I'm happiest when I'm planting, planning, planting, building, preserving, and all other steps. I I feel like my time meant something more than a dollar sign. Very good. Let's see here. I'm just going to make a big scroll down here and see another one. I'm looking to have a much healthier lifestyle all around, being outside more, breathing fresh air, and moving towards a more self-sufficient lifestyle with a real sense of purpose. Very, very good. I've always felt drawn drawn to the lifestyle, be it be it from romanticized dreams or because I grew up with a grandma who grew a garden and put up food. Fast forward to having kids and now it's because of my roots, but also various health issues and eating healthy food, wanting a down-to-earth raising for our boys and the deep-seated desire to be more self-sufficient and free from the rat race. Yes, amen. I agree. Very good. Um, this person says they just grew up hungry. You know, that that's pretty good motivation for growing some food, right? I mean, it'll make you want to grow some food if you're hungry. <laughs> like to get away from people and the pride of being more self-reliant. Okay, yeah. I mean, I understand that. I'm a I'm a by myself kind of guy. I'm energized when I'm by myself more so than a crowd. I I'm not a crowd person. Anybody that knows me personally knows that about me. It takes a lot out of me and I get energized when I'm by myself. So I understand that being by yourself thing, really. I'm going to let you jump in and read more of these. There's several of them. I mean, there's just, it's a long thread of a lot of reasons. Very good stuff here. Uh, Definitely check it out at the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. Again, uh, click on that link or just go to Homestead or search Facebook for Homestead Front Porch and we'll pop up there. Request to join, answer a couple questions, yes, and uh, we'll get you right in there. So looking forward to having you in the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. Let's jump into our uh, main topic of discussion today. I want to talk about container gardening. Um, I believe it's never been more important for you to grow at least some of your own healthy food. Uh, And the good news is, I believe that anyone can do it, at least some of it, no matter where they live. Um, One great way is to garden using containers if you're in a place where you don't have a lot of land. Now, being an urban homesteader, I've always considered, you know, gardening, uh, container gardening, but fortunately, I had enough property here that I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to go to, to that. I could, I built some raised beds. I've been able to plant some things in the ground. I've just kind of utilized all the spaces around my house for growing. But this year, this past growing season, I decided to kind of up my game a little bit, right? I wanted to grow a few more things. So I turned to some container gardening. And uh, you know what? I decided that uh, I'm sold on the benefits of gardening in containers. Uh, there was a lot of things. I, I grew my cherry tomatoes this year and, 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 and some regular tomatoes and some, and some uh, containers. Um, I grew, uh, I grew some greens, uh, some lettuce in some containers. I grew, um, a lot of herbs in containers. I mean, I, I was using a lot of, I can't even think of all the things around here. I had probably 30, uh, containers sitting around in my backyard and side yard here in different places that I were growing things in this year. And, and this is the first year I've did that. In that scale, I had a couple pots sitting out in the in the past, but not not to this scale. So, what were some of the benefits? I want to take a look at some of the the pros and the cons of container gardening, and let's just see if it makes sense for you. Container gardening pros. Well, I think the biggest pro is that anyone can grow food this way, because containers don't take up a lot of space. Even if you live in an apartment, you can have a garden. If you have a balcony or a patio or even a sunny window, you can grow some food. And a container gardening enables that. It makes a way for you to grow at least some of your own healthy, pesticide-free, herbicide-free, um, organic food that that's healthy for you. So I think that that's the biggest advantage to container gardening. Here's another big advantage, I think. 
your garden can be easily moved. And that maybe someone's like, well, why would I ever want to move my garden? Well, let me tell you something. I, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you how many times I've planted something in the ground or put up a raised bed somewhere only to regret it and then go through the trouble of relocating it. Now, if you've never relocated a raised bed, like a four by eight raised bed, that's a lot of soil to move. And then it's sit there for a few months, and now you have to replant the grass that was in that area or something. I mean, it's a lot of work moving a raised bed. And uh, you could probably scroll through some past pictures of my homestead. You could probably find our Facebook group or whatever, and you can see I had some raised beds in certain places, and then I didn't have raised beds there, and I moved them over to another area. So I've had to move some raised beds, and I've shuffled things around this yard because when I first started this, you know, and, and I don't regret this, but I just did it. I just threw up some raised beds and I started growing things. Well, then as I'm learning things and, you know, I'm kind of growing in my in my knowledge and understanding of, of urban homesteading, especially where you have to worry about, you know, sunlight <laughs> and you have to worry about uh, just access and, and just so many things. You know, I, I had to kind of change the infrastructure, the the layout even, the design of my homestead. And by doing that, it meant totally redoing everything and, and figuring out where I needed to put things. So I did a lot of moving. What well, with containers? That ain't an issue. I mean, worst case scenario is you have these really big pots, something that you can even grow a fruit tree in, and you can move those with a two-wheel cart. So um, you can move your garden. And, and maybe if you're in a, maybe you're in a situation where it isn't a long-term homestead for you. Maybe you're in an apartment. Maybe you're in town and you think, this is not my forever home. We plan on living here a year or two, and then we're going to find us another place, a bigger yard, whatnot, to grow a garden. Well, container gardening can be a great way to do that because you can move that garden. Uh, shuffle it around your yard and move it. Also, you can move it seasonally. Say you want you have some perennials or you have something you want to grow year-round, you can bring those things in the house when they've been setting out all summer. Move them to the greenhouse. Um, wh whatever. You can move them around. Maybe they're getting too much sun where they're at and you want to move them into a more sh spotted, uh, uh, indirect sunlight area. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they're getting a little too much shade and you want to move those plants out into the sunlight more. There's a lot you can do and and with containers that you can't do with anything else. And I really found myself moving around those containers quite a bit. Some of my herbs were getting too much sun. It was, it was beating them to death. I had to move them into a more spotty sunlight area. Uh, I had some things that were the opposite, like tomatoes, and I wanted to move them more into the sun. Um, so, again, they can be easily moved. Um, another pro, a big one, is weeds are not a problem. You know, if you use a good quality potting soil, you're going to ensure that uh, you ain't got no long days of crawling through your garden, searching out the, the latest nemesis, trying to smother out and rob nutrients from your, your uh, beloved vegetable plants, right? You're just not going to have that problem. And, and, you know, raised beds eliminate a lot of that, but I use a lot of topsoil in my, you know, raised beds when I first build them. So there's some weed seed in there. And I, now once you get a lot of that pulled out, you don't have as big a problem later, but I did have that problem even in, in my raised beds to an extent. Didn't have that problem with my uh, container plants because I'm using good organic potting soil that I either made, I made some of it, that, but it was good stuff. It was had been composted really hot. Any seeds were burned up in it. Or I bought some. I did buy some potting soil, some good organic potting soil, and I used in a lot of those containers. So, you know, you just don't have that problem of dealing with weeds, which is a, <laughs> trust me, if you're, if you've done a lot of gardening, you know, it can, it can be a, it can be a headache, especially when you're planted in the ground directly, because, you know, those edges will just, you know, that crabgrass and things like that just start crawling into your garden. It becomes a challenge. I know that around my raised beds, I have mulch. I have, I lay in landscape fabric down and I completely mulch that area and all the pathways around my, uh, my raised beds. Let me tell you something. Four inches of, it was about three to four inches of wood chips I put down on top of landscape fabric when I first put that down. Now it's flattened down a lot and, you know, time. This has been, you know, a couple years ago. Well, I'm out there pulling crabgrass out of that every day. And that's with landscape fabric and mulch. Now I can go over and put four or five more, you know, inches of mulch. I haven't done that. I'll probably have to do that next year and, you know, kind of smother that some of that out. But I'm pulling crabgrass up that's actually, and it's going through the landscape fabric. I'm pulling the roots up through the fabric. It's not just seeds that are in the mulch. This stuff is down deep, and it's found its way up. And, you know, I'll pull out dandelions and things like that out of this, out of this mulch. So, I mean, even when you, you know, lay cardboard down and, or, or landscape fabric down and mulch down, there's still a level 
of uh, of weeding you have to do. Uh, at least I find myself having to do it. Some people say, you know, I can use the, you know, back to Eden Garden method and I've never had to deal with weeds. Well, yeah, I think that that's the case if you're putting down like, you know, 10, 12 inches of wood chips, you know, but uh, unless you're going to do that, you're probably going to have some weed issues. So, yeah, I mean, I really I really think that's a big one. Let's look at a few of the cons of, of and these are cons that are worth taking serious. Uh, paying attention to the soil moisture is definitely more critical when you're dealing with containers. Containers have to be watered very regularly. They have to be checked for moisture. They're going to dry out much quicker. You're probably going to have to water them daily. Um, if watering your containers is hard for you to make time for and remember, you're going to want to set up a drip irrigation system. You know, something that kind of weaves over the top of each container, line up your containers, run your irrigation system over the top of it from plant to plant and throughout your whole garden. Uh, because if you miss a few days of watering these things, they're going to die. They're going to dry out really bad, and they're going to die. Uh, they have to be watered. And I don't have an irrigation system. I do all my stuff hand watering. So I was out there. If it wasn't raining, I was out there daily watering my plants in the container gardens. I enjoy that. It's it's You know, I've never put in an irrigation system for one reason. And that one reason is that when I get home from work every day, I enjoy going out and messing around in my garden. It's It really is for the most part, my favorite time of the day. I love to go out there and pull a few weeds and water my garden. So it's not a big deal for me. I, it's just something I enjoy doing. Um, but if it is an issue for you or if time's an issue for you, you're definitely going to want to put an irrigation system over the top of those pots. And, and it can be done just like it can be done in raised beds or a regular garden. You just run the the little drip irrigation hoses over the top of the pots and you kind of fix them in, you know, put your little uh stakes that hold it in right there with your little drip irrigation nozzle right there at the plant and then you just run it down you can lay some things over the you know the the hose or kind of hide it between the pots or whatever or kind of run it behind them where you don't really see it but uh, you can do it just the same with pots as you can anything else so it's it's a not a bad way to go and i'm pretty pressed for time like i said but that's just my way of kind of uh, chilling out in the evening, you know, going out here and spending a little time. But if that's not you, you you definitely want to run an irrigation system for your containers because, wow, do they dry out fast, and, and it's something you really got to deal with. Um, something else with uh, another con of, of container gardening is your soil is going to have to be occasionally replaced, probably every year. Um, because of the limited microbiology within a container, you know, simply adding uh, – supplements to the con- to the soil in the containers it's not going to sustain them forever you're going to have to do that um through the uh, throughout the year i'll put some coffee grounds i'll put some manure or some compost in there mix that in there a little bit around the top and you know i'll keep that going through the year but you're still at the end of the year probably going to want to dump those out i dump that old soil in into the compost kind of mix it in let it set for a few months kind of get rejuvenated but i'll pack that with new potting soil and um, you're going to have to do that once a year to keep enough nutrients uh, for for your plants. Now, it kind of depends, I guess. If you're growing leafy greens, you can probably go a lot longer. They don't require the nutrients that, like, something like a tomato plant. Like, if you're planting tomatoes in your containers, you're going to have to change that soil because they're going to take up a lot of the nutrients out of that soil. And you're going to have to feed them, them containers a lot uh, for, for to maintain the, the nutrients um, for that plant. Some plants obviously take more nutrients than others. Fruiting plants, for example, are going to take a lot more than, than leafy greens. So, you know, take that into consideration, but it's something you're going to have to do. You're going to have to replace that. You're going to have to dump them out and replace that. But it's not hard. I mean, that's the another beauty of uh, of containers. I mean, how hard is it to, to turn it upside down and fill it up again? It's pretty easy. So, But it is something you got to do. Probably the biggest con I've found with uh, container gardening is that containers can be really expensive. The bigger and the higher quality the container is, the more expensive it is. You know, but the good news is a lot of things can be repurposed and used as planting containers. Um, you know, from five gallon buckets to wash tubs, basically anything that can hold a few inches minimum of soil and you can put drain holes in it. Uh, it can be a container for growing some kind of vegetable. Guys, I hope you're not hearing my scanner in the background. I forgot to turn it down. It's on the other side of the room. But I can hear it, and I'm thinking, man, is that coming through in the podcast? I hope not. I just now kind of heard it in the background, but it's a police scanner we have in our house. And uh, I just realized it was on, and I forgot to turn it down. So anyway, I think containers can be really expensive, 
And uh, I've looked, you know, if you want to get the high quality stuff, now you can get cheap plastic ones and they're going to last you two, three years, but they're out there in that sun. They're going to start breaking down and cracking, getting brittle, uh, breaking on you. But they are inexpensive. I mean, you, I found some, I found some pretty cheap ones at a dollar general store that were pretty good size. And I'm talking a couple bucks, you know, Hey, if that lasts two or three years, that's awesome. You know, that's awesome. I mean, that's pretty inexpensive to replace. Now, if you're going to buy some really heavy duty stuff, you can pay hundreds of dollars for a container. And, uh, so, you know, depending on how big it is, I mean, if you're getting some, wanting a big heavy duty container that you can grow like, um, uh, fruit trees in, for example, uh, you're going to pay, you're going to pay some money for that container. So, you know, just be aware that it's, it can be expensive buying a bunch of containers. But one, the good thing is a lot of these containers you buy, you, you never have to buy them again. You buy them, they're going to last you probably the rest of your life. If you don't drop and break them. Okay. Cause they're that heavy duty and they're that high quality. So, you know, you, you weigh it out, uh, cheap, buy more of them, expensive, never buy them again. You know, you make that a frugal decision on your own because both of them can be a frugal decision. Talk a little bit about vegetables that grow easily in containers. Basically anything can be grown in a container. Anything can be grown in a container, even fruit trees, but no doubt some things do better. And, and unless you have an assortment of very large containers that just about anything would grow in, if you're going to use normal, what I'm going to consider like your average size container, something that's gallon or less, probably, you know, a lot of smaller, you know, pots, shallow root vegetables are going to do best. Um, you know, a lot, like I said earlier, your leafy greens. I grew a lot of cherry tomatoes in five gallon buckets this year. You know, that worked out really good. That's a fairly deep container though, you know, but, but tomatoes really don't have a really deep root system. So, you know, they, they do pretty good. Uh, but lettuce, spinach, other greens do really great. Some fruiting vegetables, like I said, the cherry, cherry tomatoes did awesome in, in there this year. Root vegetables can do well as long as the container's deep enough to accommodate a deeper tap root things like radishes do really good especially your smaller more round radishes they do awesome in containers carrots surprisingly do very well in containers uh, you just got to make sure like i said your container's deep enough to to house that uh, root turnips uh, again same thing kind of like a carrot you know just make sure it's deep enough but those can be good container garden crops so these are things that all do well again anything can be grown in a container some things just grow better in containers. That's all. It, it really does depend on the container. How big is this container? <laughs> you know, that's the bottom line. But I'm going to tell you, if you, maybe you've got an area in your yard that's not real visible with the neighbors of the road or whatever, setting up a bunch of five gallon buckets is, works really good. You know, you can grow a lot of things in a five gallon bucket and, uh, they're inexpensive. Um, you know, drill a few holes in the bottom. I like to lay maybe a couple inches of, of, of gravel like some river rock or something in the bottom of them. Then I put my soil on top of that. You know, that just kind of keeps your dirt from washing out the drain holes. It kind of packs into that stone and, you know, it kind of protects the soil a little bit. And you got you a nice little container there. So five gallon buckets, if you got a source for that, they work really good. They're not, they're not the most beautiful thing, but I'll tell you, I had a couple right here and I painted them. I took some brown paint and just painted them, you know, and it, they still don't look awesome, but they look okay. They work, you know. And, um, I did a lot of that. So, you know, things like that work fine. I've seen people use like the large coffee containers. I've seen, I've seen so many things. You can repurpose a lot of things to use as a container and you can plant some stuff in there, but there's almost nothing that can't grow in a five gallon bucket. It's, probably, it's got plenty of depth to it. It's, uh, it just works good. So it really just depends on the container as to what vegetables you can grow. But those shallow root vegetables will grow in any of them. I mean, you grow lettuce and gutters. I mean, it, it really doesn't take a lot of space, right? So what do you think? Is container gardening right for you? Well, whether it is or not, I hope what you'll do is be inspired to start growing some of your own healthy organic food. You know, begin a, a journey of food freedom, self-sufficiency. Some of the reasons we went over why people want to do this in the first place um, back in that Facebook group thread. If you're not growing anything because you're waiting one day to have a property you think you can grow something on, stop using it. Just stop using that excuse. Get you some containers and start growing something. So I hope this helps you get started, gives you some inspiration, gets you some motivation, and uh, gets you out there and start growing some things. So uh, there you have it, container gardening. Uh, if you want, you can um, jump in. Uh, 
go to uh, smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 65. There's a place below where you can leave some comments if you want on your thoughts or your questions about container gardening. We'd love to hear what you have to say about container gardening. Has it made a difference in your life? Or do you have some further thoughts on it? Do you have any questions about it? Go ahead and share them there. Or again, you can join the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group and ask your questions or make your comments in there. Okay, how about some recommendations? Today's recos. Um, I want to recommend a couple books. I mentioned these in our Facebook group a couple weeks ago, or one of them a couple weeks ago, one just the other day. A couple books I ran across. I finished listening to a book called The $100 Startup. Reinvent the way you make a living, do what you love, and create a new future. Great book. If you've ever thought about starting a full-time business or just a side hustle from your homestead, I believe this might just be a, a must-read for you. Again, it's called The $100 Startup. I cannot pronounce the author's last name, so I won't even try. But I'll tell you, it's a really good book. I actually listened to it on Audible. I haven't. I just signed up for Audible, so I actually listened to it for free. I mean, it was like a 20-something dollar book. And I got a, I just got me an Audible account and I had a month, first month free and they gave me two books for that first month for free. So I took advantage of that. And I don't know if I'm going to even keep it. I probably will because there's a few other books I want to listen to. So if you're like me, maybe you're out doing chores every day and you got a lot of time where you can listen to things. Audible is a really good way to go. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a link to the hundred dollar startup book in the show notes, but I'll also put a link to Audible that you can check out through Amazon. Amazon, I guess, owns Audible. So if you're interested in checking out Audible and listening to audiobooks, you might just want to buy this book, though. I think it's a great book to have. It's one I might even consider buying, like, the Kindle version of or something so I can have it around to look at it. Um, but if you ever thought about turning your homestead into a full-time business or something about your homestead into a full-time business, uh, The $100 Startup's a good book. Another book, and, you know... I've had this book for a long time, but I find myself keep going back to it. And I just think it's the best book for this. Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Home Scale Permaculture. It's the second edition. You know, in my opinion, uh, this book by Toby Hemingway. Toby Hemingway, by the way, I think died the last year he passed away. Um, but he left, a, he left a legacy for us. This book is awesome. I think it's the best of all the permaculture books. I really do. Maybe it's because I'm an urban homesteader and it has a lot to do with that. Um, and I know saying it's the best of the permaculture books is saying a lot, you know, considering the work of Mollison and Holmgren and Holzer, but this book just seems to me, to me to be the most practical for application on my homestead. So I love it. Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. Check that book out. I'll put links again for all that in the show notes, episode 65. Uh, appreciate y'all listening. I, I can't even tell you what it means to me <laughs> that I get so many good reviews for this podcast at iTunes. I get so many emails from you. I get so many good comments in the Facebook group all the time about the podcast. Guys, I'm just a guy. You know, I work a full-time job. I'm doing a little homestead. I share with you because I love homesteading. I've seen the difference it's made in my life and the food that I eat, um, the things that, you know, that I'm able to grow and raise on my property. It's just made a complete difference in my life. I do that po this podcast because I... I, I want to help it make a difference in your life as well. I want to encourage other people to start wherever they're at, whatever they're doing. That's why urban homesteading, I guess, particularly holds a, holds a, a it's a special passion of mine. I grew up on a full size, you know, out in the country homestead where we had lots of, we had cows and pigs and chickens and everything. I grew up that way. I mean, so I have a passion for homesteading in general, but because I'm in town and I have an urban homestead, I just have a passion for those people who are say, oh, I just want to live in the country one day and have a homestead. Have a homestead now. And I do this podcast to encourage you mostly. I'm also here for those who have a fully functioning, full-size homestead. I talk a little bit about that, no doubt. But I have a passion for those people who want to get started and they want to make a difference in their life. Folks, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, start homesteading. Start homesteading. And I do this podcast for you mainly. And I appreciate all of you who appreciate what I'm doing. I really do. I appreciate your iTunes reviews. I appreciate those of you who donate and help out by using our Amazon link at our website so I can pay for this because it does cost a little bit. I pay, you know, a few hundred bucks a year to do my website, to, to, to maintain this podcast and to host the, the audio files. Um, and it costs a little bit of money. I appreciate those of you who go to our site, go to smalltownhomestead.com, click on our Amazon affiliate link and then shop Amazon using that. 
I really appreciate that. So there's, and again, those of you who appreciate it by leaving reviews and things, I really appreciate that as well. So I thank you. I always look forward to reading those. I always enjoy your emails. I may not always comment back because, again, I'm a busy guy, but I always appreciate it. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.